Well, hey everybody, Brian Goulet here of GouletPens.com, and it's episode number 242 of Goulet Q&A. It's the end of January, and I just got back from New Orleans last week. You may have seen if you followed me on Instagram, the little pen meet up there. I was actually there for business. I was there for a work conference, if you will, because I do do those things, even though I'm, you know, not exactly in the corporate world. Um, it was a networking thing, trying to learn, and uh, it was an e-commerce related thing, so that was kind of fun. Um, got to learn how to better do business for you all. So that was really good, um, but I appreciate you accommodating me last week with Q&A being shot a week early. We're back on schedule this week, so I'm shooting this on Wednesday afternoon like normal. Uh, I do have one little special thing that I wanna call out. So we have a handwritten note survey that if we don't have it up by the time this video is up, it'll be very, very, very soon. So basically I alluded a couple of weeks ago to the fact that we're having a hard time keeping up with some of our handwritten thank you notes. So we're gonna be rethinking that. We wanna know, um, you know, what's sustainable for the future, what means the most to you all. It's something we've done from day one, from the very first order that shipped out. So it's very romantic. Of course, we've been doing it consistently for nine years and three months. So I don't wanna take any changes that we have to this process lightly. That said, I also don't want to um, just end up having to forfeit and <laughs> give them up anyway because there are other aspects of running this business that are demanding lots of our time. So um, if you could take that survey when you see it up, if we have it up on the YouTube video by the time that comes, we'll put it in the description. If not, um, look for it elsewhere. I think we'll put it in the description at whatever point that we have it ready. Um, but please leave your two cents there. We wanna know the different components of the handwritten thank you notes and what matters to you so that any changes that we would need to make, we would know would be least impactful and we don't want to just take something away we want to give something else in return so knowing what pieces and parts of it are most meaningful will help us do that so thank you for your time and energy there um let's see here what do we have i've got a bunch of pen things because i was basically gone for two weeks so um i'm gonna try and cover some of that stuff i bravely chose eight questions for today's q a so we're gonna see how well i actually do with that so today's uh Topics include talking about budget eyedropper pens, using 20 pens at a time, and fixing pens that dry up on a regular basis, among other things. So let me start out with some of the new pens that have come. The Diplomat Esteem is one of them. We got a lot of pens in that like next level price range, in that like $50 to $100 price range. That's something that a lot of you asked about. And in the holidays, it was like, why are you only coming out with really expensive and really cheap pens? Where is the stuff in the middle? Um, now we have a bunch of stuff in the middle and not a whole bunch <laughs> else on the other ends. This is how it goes sometimes, you know? We can't just like make it up. We gotta pick up whatever is offered, basically. Um, but we got a bunch of stuff like right in here. You know, it's a lot of Monte Verde, some Conklin, some stuff right in that range, then kind of their sweet spot. And uh, Diplomats is one brand, uh, a German brand, relatively new for us. There's been some energy behind the Aero and the Traveler and the Magnum. Um, but Esteem was one that we kind of left off. We wanted to start out with some of the, what we thought would be the more popular models. And the Esteem um, just didn't make the cut for us. Uh, however, the rest of the brand's been pretty popular, so we're picking this one up. It's got number six, Yovo Steel Nibs, which are really good. We are very familiar with them because Yovo makes our Goulet nibs. Um, so you can get those in fine and medium. And the um, price range is $64. So it's right in that nice sweet spot. It's got four colors. Part of the reason it got on our radar again is because they're coming out with a hot new red color, which I don't have right here with me to show you, but it's gonna be a really exciting color that's uh, gonna get some attention around it. So uh, the Esteem, if it's not on your radar already, it uh, kind of falls in the middle of the size between the Traveler and the Excellence. And uh, so it's a little bit closer to the Traveler size. So it's a nice kind of like mid-size, mid-thickness, smooth rider. It's gonna be a well-performing pen. So it's definitely worth checking out if you like sort of that more you know, professional kind of polished looking pen. But the red one's kind of exciting. So I wanted that on your radar. Uh, new pen, the Monteverde Prima. It's coming back. We used to have this a while ago, um, but they got some new colors and stuff that we got on our radar again. So this is a Monteverde pen. This is in that uh, $68 price range, five different colors. This is the turquoise one. And these are the same cast resins that you see in like Edison pens and much higher end pens. Um, a relatively affordable pen for that. 
Um, just for us, we have um, Bach nibs on these. So these are German Bach nibs. are going to be smooth, high quality nibs. These are uh, extra fine, fine and medium on this one, stainless steel. And uh, it's a pretty, it's pretty nice weighted pen. It's got some metal components, so it's got a little bit of weight to it, but the resin keeps it a little bit lighter. So I think this is going to be a good, like kind of carry around daily writer style of pen, cartridge converter. Um, as of the Diplomat, which I forgot to mention. Standard International on both of these. Uh, yeah, I just think it's it's a pen worth taking another look at, which is why we picked it back up. So you can check that one out if you're interested. The Monteverde Essenza. This is a new pen, new model, new to Monteverde. Um, and it's something that we uh, have on our radar as well. This is a faceted pen. So it's got some metal components. This has a little more weight to it than the Prima does. So, and it's got a slick metal grip section, which I know some people like, some people don't. So just, you know, so you are aware that that's happening. Uh, cartridge converter pen on this one as well, standard international. Um, and it's a faceted design, which is uh, relatively complicated to do because you can't just injection mold it. You can't just spin it. Um, so this is another cast resin material as well uh, that uh, I think looks nicer than its price states, which is $76 on this one. Um, and this is a Bach number six nib on it as well, an extra fine, fine and medium. Now, again, this is the Bach thing is something that we are doing um, just to try to be special. Um, they have their own Monteverde nibs that are being sold elsewhere. Uh, and then we have another Monteverde, since why not? The Rodeo Drive. This is one that we tested out just a little bit. We had some closeout ones, which were the old version that had a colored body and a metal, all metal, like chrome cap. Uh, we wanted to, um, you know, give you a deal on those because we bought basically their old stock and, and cleared it out for you. Um, but they have some new colors now. So they are, something just made a noise behind me. I don't know what. I think it was my hustle sign <laughs> slid down a little bit. Um, but anyway, so there's new colors here, including the Polaris, which the Polaris color has been really popular in the Northern Lights. Um, and so we wanted to, uh, sorry, it was called Northern Lights. And this is Northern Lights. Oh, here my talk. This is Polaris. It was Northern Lights in the Regatta Sport. That's what I'm thinking. <sighs> Similar effects though, that bluish purplish kind of color. Looks really classy. Um, and yeah, very fun, but there's other colors too. So we have four colors of that $68 for these number six Bach extra fine, fine and medium on that. They're all metal. They're a little bit heavier metal grip section. Um, but it's not too bad. It's the same grip section that's on the Invincia if you're familiar with that one. So it's kind of contoured a little bit comfortable grip, but again, it is metal. So just be aware of that. All right. What else we got? Conklin Crescent and Vintage Green. I think I mentioned that before, but we have that. Seems to be pretty popular. We have some new colors of Conklin Empires and they lowered the prices a little bit. So you can check those out on the site. I don't have them because frankly, I just ran out of time from pulling pens on this one. Um, another pen that I have, uh, The let's see here. Wait, hang on. Um, Lamy Vibrant Pink package sets. So we had these sold out of a bunch. We're restocking. Um, basically, Lamy is kind of coming towards the end of their uh, Vibrant Pink. You know, they're going to be coming out with a new uh, All Star and some new Safaris and stuff like that for 2019. So their Vibrant Pink from last year, the 2018, is going to be seeing its way out. Um, they actually made adequate, you know, pretty adequate stock of the Vibrant Pinks. So they are kind of putting them uh, in nice little package sets, and we are going to clear them out so you can get some good deals on that. It's been pretty popular. The Aurora 88 Mira Unica is here, I believe. Um, I don't have that one to show you, but you can check it out on our site. We have some Robert Oster Crystal Marine ink, nice teal color there, um, as well as Three Oysters Marine Green, which I've been using that a little bit. Another really nice darker teal color. My jam is like, you know, kind of this shade of teal turquoise, whatever you want to call it, and it's kind of right in that zone. So lots of good teals coming out right now. Um, and speaking of teals, the Twisby 580 All Emerald uh, has launched this week. It's been pretty popular so far. We talked about it in right now, so I won't belabor it, but it will be making a feature uh, later in the video today. So I just wanted to call that one out. And I will say I, this, this color is everything I hoped it would be. So I'm very happy about this one. Uh, and then what else have we got? The Diplomat Arrow in red. You saw this come out about three months ago from the Andersons. Uh, they had an exclusive launch on this one, and now that launch has uh, released its exclusivity. So 
Um, good job on them for getting the exclusive on that. And if you haven't seen it already, uh, we now have it as well as all the other retailers. So you can check that one out. Same arrow pen as like the violets and the orange that we've had, um, but it's in the new red color. And it's a, it's a pretty bright red. It's got just, a, just the slightest hint of orange to it. You know, so it's not like a pure, you know, candy apple red. It's just a little bit on the orange side, but great pen. The capping uh, action on this pen is one of my favorite of all times. And it's got a stainless steel Yovo nib, great performing pen, extra fine, fine, medium, and broad on the arrow. And it's number six size, so it's nice and big, made by Yovo in Germany, so it's gonna perform well. And the last pen that I wanted to show you before I get into the questions, this one's gonna take me a minute, so please forgive me, but I thought it was worth showing because I have the Graf von Faber-Castell 2019 Pen of the Year Samurai. And they actually made two different versions of this. We ordered both, but we've only gotten the first one in. So we have the one that's the Magnolia Wood version. So I wanna show you that one. And the reason I wanted to show you, and I actually have it behind me, and I'm gonna give you the whole, um, the whole unboxing, um, because this pen to me was the one that I had on my radar very early on before really I even started selling fountain pens, back when I was a pen maker. Um, I was making pens out of wood back in 2007 to 2009, um, before Goulet Pens in its current form uh, took off. And uh, Faber-Castell was one brand, Graf von Faber-Castell especially, was one that was on my radar because they make a lot of pens out of wood. And that's not something a lot of companies will do. It's, it's kind of difficult. You know, wood is a natural material. It's prone to, you know, weather changes and the environment and ink stains and all these types of things, um, unless it's really done well. And Faber-Castell is one brand that has done it really well. So I kind of looked up to them and a lot of their, their pens of the year are truly fantastic. They've been doing the pen of the year thing since 2003. Uh, so they have a bunch of them now, and several of them have been really nice, really elaborately themed wood pens, uh, including the one that I'm gonna show you today. So for me, this is kind of like, I don't know, I guess a milestone of sorts to be able to offer a Graf von Faber-Castell pen of the year. So I wanted to give it a little bit of love and show you the unboxing because the presentation is pretty tight. So here is the box that it comes in right here. Yes, this is the box, pretty large. And I don't want to botch the German, but I just want to have what a statement that that makes right on the top there. So it says, fragile, handle with care. In the German version, let's hear, Bluch Genfahr nicht werfen. Probably butchered that, I apologize. But I appreciate the messaging there. Um, how am I going to show this to you? I'm going to try and maybe open it up on the side. Can you see that okay? So nice thick cardboard, it's that like double layered cardboard, you know, that's nice and sturdy. So this pen is not going to get damaged in transit unless something crazy happens. A little extra cardboard on the top there, can't have too much cardboard. And then you got all these like little cardboard compartments, very thoughtful packaging on this. They don't just like throw it in a box and go. Um, so a lot of the cardboard here on the side is just for like extra padding. Really the meat of the thing is this big box that you have right here in the center and it's got this little flap that you can lift up, ta-da, and there's the white box. So this is obviously the, the main event. Oh, I gotta stand up, can't even get the leverage I need. Okay, so here's the main box. And I'm gonna set the rest of this aside because I have opened this up once before because I wanted to strategize. So I will get to that. It's not, this is not everything. So um, there's, a, there's a method to my madness here. So you have this, I wanna very carefully open this because this is a real pen and it has not yet sold. So this will belong to one fortunate collector who has yet to actually buy this pen. I bought it on spec, um, but yeah, look at this box. Boom. So if you actually do end up buying this pen from our site, it's the one we have. So this will be your pen, personally inspected by yours truly on video for all to see. So it's got a nice little Graf von Faber-Castell in the top there. Nice little logoing, nice sturdy construction on here. And the box is super nice. So that's the actual pen box. Nice piano black finish with the Graf von Faber-Castell logo in it. It's got a nice flap and look at this. It's like it's padded. The inside of this box is actually padded with a black lining. I'm gonna slide this out very delicately. I mean, look at that, the lining on the inside, the inside of the box just for that. So like, mm, 
Very, very thoughtful packaging. And then here's the box itself. So if you are getting this, I mean, the presentation and all that, this is like, this is meant to sit out on your desk, like to brag to all your friends, to be like, I'm a fancy pen and I'm a fancy person with a fancy pen. Or maybe you're not a fancy person, you just like fancy pens. Anyway, so you lift this thing up and it's like, wow, <laughs> look at that presentation logo on here. Like, I appreciate all that. It's even got like a little plastic here so it won't get like shaken around in transit. And then of course you want to see what I see, which is you open it up, you pull out this, this nice little felt, whoop, hello. It's hard to like show you and hold it. Oh, you can see it okay. Like a little monitor where I can see what's going on. And I'm going to reveal the absolutely magnificent pen. What? There's no pen in here because it's still in the box. Anyway, I thought that was really kind of funny when I opened it for the first time. I was like, where's the pen? So they don't want the pen like shaking around in transit. So they don't actually include the pen in the box in transit. I think most of these, they sell in physical brick and mortar stores. So they, they ship it so that it can be packaged to the retailer and the retailer can unbox and, and present the thing. So if you're buying it online, you're gonna receive this thing uh, with no pen inside the actual box. So just be prepared for that. That's half the reason I wanted to show this to you. So it's cool, it's got a little box in here. It's got a little spot for the pen. It's got, uh, it's a samurai theme obviously, so it's got the samurai on here. And then it has a pen tray underneath. So if you, you know, have all of your other pens of the year that you like, and you like this box better than the other ones, you can uh, collect them all down in the bottom there. Or maybe you can just hide it down in there and fool people because there's no pen in here. So that's the box itself, which is pretty sweet as it is, honestly. Their packaging is pretty on point. Um, you know, you're spending this much on a pen, you're like, you want to get your money's worth on the box. And you're doing that on this one. So I will gently put that back in. I won't like anal retentively pack this thing back in here. What I'm going to do after this video is over is I'm going to take a cloth and like wipe this the whole thing down, uh, halfway unpack it again and just make sure that it looks absolutely sublime. So I'll put this back here for now. With its box, being very careful. And for the part that you actually want to see, the pen itself actually comes in this tiny little box here. Again, this is made more to be like shipped to a retailer and the retailer take it out, just like I'm doing now. So you're like, okay, that's kind of interesting. I've never really seen this before. So it literally calls it pen of the year transport packaging says that on the side there. So the pen itself comes in this, it's a nice little foam thing. So like, there's really no way this thing is gonna get damaged in transit. And then the pen comes rested in this nice little sleeve with the logo on it as well. Very thoughtful packaging, even more. And then it comes inside this tissue wrap inside this plastic. So they really protect this well. So I'm gonna pull this thing out of here. Be careful not to like overly crinkle this paper so that you get it in your more pristine state and the pen itself boom look at this monster it is a honker of a pen i mean a large pen very much like cigar shaped it almost literally looks like a cigar with like a topper on it so I'll give you a nice little close-up of the pen here boom see if we can make this a thumbnail andy shazam look at that sucker beautiful, beautiful pen. Somebody's calling me. I don't want to talk to you. Okay. I'm talking to other people right now. Um, so gorgeous, gorgeous craftsmanship. I mean, there, I've literally never seen a flaw on a Graf von Faber-Castell pen, particularly a pen of the year. Um, so what this pen is, it's a samurai themed and it actually includes, of course I put all of my pens on top of it, but includes this nice little booklet that has all the history and everything of the samurai and why they did the pen the way they did. There's two versions of this pen. One is made of dyed magnolia wood, which magnolia wood apparently was what they used to make a lot of the handles for the samurai swords. So there's significance there. And there is an inscription that's painted onto here, which is translated to today, I win against myself of yesterday which is pretty cool, right? So that's a quote from the great samurai warrior, Miyamoto Musashi. I can't remember things to, for anything, so I wrote it down, but Miyamoto Musashi. Uh, it's not an inexpensive pen. In fact, it is $3,900. But if you are into collector pens, 
This one is pretty on point and Samurai stuff is pretty darn cool. It's a piston filler. It has an ink window, which I actually kind of caught me on surprise. And the grip itself, I'll show you, has a theming like the wrapping that it would have on the handle of a samurai sword. So what they would do, samurai, is they would have a magnolia wood handle and then they would wrap stingray leather around it in a pattern very much like what you see. And that's why they have that theme. Very cool. 18 karat gold nib, of course, is gonna write very well. And it's a pretty heavy pen, but it's actually fairly well balanced. It's not the thing that I would say you should probably post, but it can be done if you would like to do so. It's gonna be a little back heavy though, because this cap is solid metal. And then it has an inscription here in the top, which I believe means something to the effect of grip handle or something like that. It was kind of a traditional thing so um, for the samurai. So, so you can see what that looks like. Really, really cool pen. Um, so yeah, I'm just really kind of digging this one. I saw this in person uh, and I just knew that we had to carry it. Um, so again, kind of a milestone for me personally. I'm going to tuck it away in its little sleeve and then pack it up very nicely once we are all done with the video. But it can just kind of rest there. It can chill there next to me while we shoot the video. Um, yeah, there we go, a little, little graph. Uh, and the one we have is a fine nib. If you're into another nib size, reach out to us and let us know. I'm not sure how much we can swap it out or anything like that, but we thought fine nib would be a pretty popular one. So we'll see how that goes. So if you're interested, we have that one in stock. Um, and we're going to carry the other version, which is a metal barrel with an engraved gold, um, you know, stripe and dotted pattern, which also looks really, really cool. And that one's got gunmetal trim. So anyway, if you're interested in either of those, we will have them first year, 2019, the Goulet pens will carry the Graf pen of the year. I'm pretty pumped. Anyway, back to reality here. Now I'm going to talk about like $4 pens, okay? <laughs> So if you're like, wow, that's really cool, but it's like, it's neat. It's kind of aspirational. Like I'm not even going to have this pen, um, but it's really cool to see one, right? And have it featured. So anyway, um, questions that we have for this week, I'm going to start out with pen and writing questions. First one is from Gary M on Facebook. What are the best budget eyedropper pens among your brands? Okay. So um, you can look on our site. Eyedropper is literally one of the drop downs. If you go to all fountain pens up in the top nav, and then you look on the sidebar and you can see the different options, color, nib size, all these different things, you can select eyedropper fill or filling mechanism as an option to see what uh, what pens we have. Uh, and then you can sort by price, low to high. Uh, that's what I did because I was like, what are all the eyedropper pens we have? You know, I was trying to remember. And so I just, I often use our website as reference when prepping for this video. Little life hack there for you, insights into the mind of uh, how I prep these videos. And uh, starting out with uh, one of, I think the most iconic eyedropperable pens. It was actually the first video I ever made of an eyedropper pen or the process, the Platinum Preppy. Okay, so Platinum is a phenomenal pen, $4, $5, depending on which version you're getting. Um, this is the Preppy Crystal, and I actually have this one eyedroppered already, a little silicone grease on it, a little O-ring. They don't come this way, but it's very easy to do. You can see an extremely old video of me in my garage, one of the least flattering videos I've ever made, but still incredibly helpful, so it's still up there. Uh, you can check that one out on how to do this. Um, or you can have us do it for you. We've done that for a while too, um, specifically with the Platinum Preppy. Again, it's like OG eyedropper conversion, kind of a classic one there, especially because the converter cost $8. So you can buy a $4 pen, eyedropper convert it, and have a bunch of O-rings left over for less than just getting a converter. So very popular option. Um, newer, relatively newer pen that we have, less than a year, um, the Jinhao Shark. And this is a cartridge converter pen, it actually comes with a converter. $4 pen, very affordable, very cool. Lots of colors. I actually just gave away a bunch of these in New Orleans at the meetup. And so I was like, I need some more. Well, let me just grab one of every color for myself. That's the perk, perk of the job here. So I got all the colors. We have 11, I think, different colors of these sharks. Uh, pretty much anything that you could want. Um, but it is eyedropper convertible as well. So all you gotta do is drop the converter out of there, some silicone grease on here, an O-ring doesn't hurt, and then you fill the body with ink and you're good to go. Then you can have lots of ink in here and uh, you can be on your merry way. So there you go, Jinhao Shark Pen. 
uh, very affordable. Uh, another one that has a really high ink capacity, the Noodler's Ahab. This is another classic that I love to eyedropper convert or recommend eyedropper converting anyway. And this one's rather versatile because you can use the piston that comes with it. Technically, Nathan calls this a removable piston, not a converter. A lot of people call it a converter, but it's not converting to cartridges. Um, but uh, anyway, it's removable as if it was, uh, you know, like a like a converter. So it's a it's a piston. Uh, you can remove that. They have Noodler's 308 cartridges, which are basically refillable capsules that you can screw on here instead of the piston um, that you can use. So that technically is sort of a cartridge. Um, Nathan is notoriously anti-cartridge, but he kind of like had a little joke with the 308 cartridge because it's like you know, 308 like bullet cartridge. Nathan is very like Americana, kind of like that. So he, a little tongue in cheek on that one. Um, but you can actually remove this. You can remove the breather tube like so, and you can eyedropper convert this sucker. Now it has an O-ring on here, but the O-ring that's on here is not for the body of the pen. That's for the piston. Um, so you'll, you don't have to necessarily throw an O-ring on this thing. You can throw a preppy O-ring. We call it a preppy O-ring because again, the Preppy was the original pen that we started carrying O-rings for, but you can really use it for a lot of different pens because it's flexible enough to be able to uh, adapt. Um, so you can throw one of those on here or honestly just a little silicone grease. The threads are tight enough where it'll hold uh, and you can get a six milliliter ink capacity eyedropper conversion on this Ahab, which is pretty much about as big as it gets. Um, and six milliliters is just kind of an insane amount of ink. Um, the nice thing about having a larger ink capacity, you know, when you're using an eyedropper pen, uh, it tends to burp on you, um, especially when it's changing ink, uh, changing relative temperatures, like right now when it's really cold outside, you know, we're having like an Arctic blast that's, you know, freezing more than half our country right now. And uh, you're coming inside and it's like 75 degrees. Uh, so that tends to wreak havoc on pens, uh, but, with a larger ink capacity eyedropper or pen like this, you can keep it more full, minimize the air that's inside the pen that will more stabilize uh, the ink inside the pen body. It's when you have a lot of ink and just a or sorry, a lot of air and just a little bit of ink that the ink tends to get unstable because of the variation in the pressure and temperature and stuff like that of the air inside the pen with its surrounding environment. Little extra bonus fact, didn't even write that down in my notes, I'm just spewing it. Um, that one's $23 for you. Uh, the Quaco Classic Sport or Ice Sport, uh, basically any plastic Quaco Sport pen. You can't eyedropper convert, I mean technically you can eyedropper convert the metal versions, but I would not recommend it because the metal uh, will corrode over time with the ink uh, contact. So any of the plastic version Quacos, uh, same kind of deal. You can These are fine threads, so you can just throw a little silicone grease on there and go, or you can put a preppy o-ring on there if you wanted to really solidify it even more. But I think honestly, the the just the silicone grease on the threads, these threads right here will do it. And you can fill the whole body of it with this. The nice advantage of doing it with the Kaweco is um, you, can, you can use the Kaweco, the little Kaweco converter, um, but pretty much you can't use a full size regular converter or you just gotta use cartridges. So the nice thing about this is a little silicone grease on there and you can fill it and you can go. Uh, and not have to worry about refilling cartridges or anything like that. So that's fun. You get a nice pocket pen with a decent size ink capacity. So ever since I got into fountain pens, this is actually one of the first six fountain pens that I ever purchased. So there you go. It was in the original. I ordered six pens, I think it was. It was like that. It was a Lamy, Black Lamy Joy. Um, what else did I order? Pelican Script um, and a couple others. I can't remember all of the first. I think I ordered a Pilot Petite one uh, and a couple other pens that I I'm failing to recall right in this moment. It might have been a couple different sizes of Pelican script. Um, yeah, so anyway, that was like, this is like one of the first fountain pens I ever used. Um, and the reason that it was on my radar at that time, back in summer of 2009, before I started selling pens, um, is because it was eyedropper convertible. So you know, a little nice little fact there about the life of Brian. Uh, and then the online slope, this is another one. Online's German brand, relatively newer for us, but um, the Slope is a relatively new pen too. You have the Switch Plus uh, is another pen that looks kind of similar. It has an ink window, but uh, I don't think with that ink window that you would want to eyedropper convert it. So if you want to use eyedropper conversion, the Slope is going to be your ticket. It's an all solid body. Um, silicone grease on here. I would recommend using an O-ring for this one just because the threads aren't quite as tight as what you have on your Ahab or on your 
uh, Kaweco. Um, Preppy's got kind of chunky threads too. Uh, same with this online slope. So I would recommend uh, O-rings, especially for those. And then last one, I'm trying to keep all of these uh, under $50. There's a lot of them that go up beyond that. Um, you know, surprisingly few pens are actually legitimately eyedropper convertible. So no wonder we get asked about it so much. Um, so it's something I'm kind of thinking about. Uh, but anyway, the Pilot Varsity. Now technically, this is an old version of it. They look way cooler now. Um, but technically, this is a pre-filled pen. It already comes loaded up with ink, and it's meant to be disposable. So you're not really supposed to think that much about what kind of filling mechanism it is, but it, that's what it is. It's eyedropper converted. The entire pen body is filled with ink, so technically it's an eyedropper. And actually, when you empty the thing out and you use it all, you can yank the fins, the whole nib mechanism and everything, right out of the thing. There's no cartridge or anything to worry about. Um, and you can refill the sucker. So, you know, even though it's meant to be disposable, you might have to kind of uh, give it a tug when you do it for the first time. But you can refill and use it. And I wouldn't recommend using uh, any shimmering ink or probably even any permanent ink because it's like a wick feed in here. And I'm sure it won't last forever. Um, but you know, at least last couple times and keep it with pretty straight conventional inks like Pilot or Shizuku or something like that. And you're probably gonna be okay and you can have a pretty cool pen for like $3.30 that you can reuse. It's a surprisingly good writer too. And you can have any nib size you want as long as it's medium. So, <laughs> uh, Pilot Varsity continues to be one of my favorite pens at all time, uh, especially for people that don't have a lot of experience with fountain pens or kids or whatever. It's already preloaded. You don't have to worry about cleaning it really. Um, so it's a nice introduction. It's smooth writer. So it's a nice introduction for fountain pen people. Cool. All right. Um, you know, I, okay. I real, I'm just realizing now I forgot to grab a pen off the shelf. Well, I'll just have to talk about this one rather quickly. Um, so this is from uh, Jillian B on Facebook. Gillian B. Jillian, not sure how you pronounce it, so I'll just say it both ways. On Facebook, deep dive on Natuno. Any updates of the ETA of the Natuno God of the Seas? I know you were really excited by Natuno when you visited them in Italy. Can you tell those of us who are interested in this pen what you particularly liked about Natuno? Not many places carry them. Who is their distributor? This is my grail at the moment and want to know more about it as I save my pennies. I love that you say my grail at the moment. <laughs> You know the whole idea behind a grail is it's supposed to be like the one pen that you are like waiting for, like the ultimate. Uh, but your grail of the moment is, is uh, it's funny because I feel the same way. It's like once you get your grail, well then you, you have a new grail, right? Anyway, it's very funny, just kind of lingo that we throw around in the pen community. Um, so Natuno, I meant to grab one off the shelf, I didn't. Uh, and so now I'm kind of regretting that, but I can at least touch on it a little bit, especially because you're really asking about the Natuno God of the Sea. I don't actually have a Natuno God of the Sea. I have not even seen one in person yet. Um, I've only seen the same pictures uh, that's got you drooling over it. Um, so I did see some of the raw kind of prototype stock material that they were using. Um, I didn't even see it turned. It was completely rough, completely raw and it kind of blew my mind even in raw stock form uh, when I was in Italy. So I'm pretty pumped about it too. Um, but again, something that it seems so cool and you wait so long, I'm always like, all right, at this point, how many are we even gonna get? It's, so I'm not like gonna overhype it. It seems pretty cool, but it's expensive. And Natuno, um, so just a little bit about Natuno. So Natuno is founded really not that long ago, last year and a half. Um, by Nino Marino. He's a uh, former founder of Delta. So Delta was founded by several partners. After Delta went under, the partners kind of split off. And Nino is um, uh, working with uh, some of the old standby, some, some uh, people um, with a lot of pen experience uh, on these new Natuno pens. So it's really kind of like a Delta revival, but it's really, uh, they're building it from the ground up. So there's a lot of work to be done there. I got to see their facility. I got to meet several people on their team. They're very excited about it, but it takes a long time to build a pen company from scratch. So they are, they are doing that. And that's why you're seeing limited distribution right now. So their distributor, I'm not sure if it's like their global distributor or if it's just in the US or what, but Yaffa is their distributor. That's who we went with over to Italy. So Yaffa distributes Monteverde, Conklin, Penider, Online, Stipula. Uh, I'm leaving some out, but 
Um, that's why we went over there is because we were going to see Stipula, we were going to see Panida, we saw uh, Natuna while we were over there, partly because they're in Naples and it's just a freaking gorgeous part of the world. Um, so we got to spend some time there. We got to see Natuno and kind of see their process. I actually shot some footage of them turning some pens and stuff like that. And there's some skilled craftsmen there that are, um, I mean, they're literally like making those pens uh, one at a time. So um, it takes a long time. They don't have like, they're not cranking pens out and they're distributing them globally. So they're just, they're kind of like sprinkling around the world. Um, so we're getting some here and there. Our stock is incredibly low on them right now. Um, so it's this kind of thing that like is not going to be, you know, super busting outside the gates. Um, so yeah, uh, I don't have that much information really about God of the Sea other than what we have on our website on the product page. Um, and I haven't seen it in person, but I will say it'll come in due time. We keep asking about it constantly. Um, but uh, when we do, we'll, we'll show it proper. That way you can see. Um, but in the meantime, sign up for our email notification list. Just on Wednesday, we talked about like, what do you do when you want something that's really hot and gets delayed and, and is limited in stock? This will be one of those pens. So um, watch our right now from Wednesday if you want to see details about that. All right. Next question is from Kevin Lucas Klein on Instagram. Is it bad if I dry my fountain pens with a napkin or paper tissue instead of letting it dry on the fresh air? The drying includes, if possible, to go inside the pen to also dry it from the inside. So I sort of understand what you're asking about here, and so I'll, I'll interpret it uh, however I will. Uh, basically, you're fine, and don't don't overthink it too much. All you're trying to do is get the water out of the pen. However you do that, frankly, is pretty good. Um, so yeah, I use I use napkins, paper towels, tissue, whatever. I just wouldn't use anything that like you know if it's a tissue that you can like see the the junk like falling off and like floating around in the air. Like, you know, yes, yeah, some tissues are better than others. If you buy like really cheap crappy ones and you like pull it out of the tissue box and you can see like there's like paper fibers floating around in the air, maybe don't use those ones uh, unless you're in an absolute pinch. You know, if you, if all you have with you is those crappy tissues because that's all your workplace buys or that's all you buy in your house or whatever, and that's it, and there's nothing else absorbent around you that you don't want to get ink all over, um, it's better than using your fingers, you know, which I've done in a pinch. Sometimes I go to a work conference or something and I'm like, you know, I, I'd like f just flown on the airplane. I didn't properly prepare my pens because I just basically stopped doing that now when I fly, I have so few issues. Um, and there's like a little bit of ink on the grip or whatever. And I'm like, well, I have no napkin, tissue, paper towel of any kind, no paper. I mean, well, sometimes I paper, I like rub it all over the thing and people are looking at me weird. Like, why are you rubbing your pen all over your, the edge of your paper? It's because I forgot a napkin. Uh, but anyway, so yeah, if I had that, I'll use a tissue or something like that. But I've, and I've had that and I've like used my finger and just like tried to like rub it all around so you don't notice it as much. You know, if you get like some ink on your finger, you just kind of like, you know, smooth it out. <laughs> Maybe that's just me, uh, but I'll totally do that. You know, as long as it's not red and you're like freaking people out at your work conference that you're like bleeding in the middle of somebody's PowerPoint presentation. And they're like, what's wrong with this guy? Why is this pen weird? Why is this pen guy so weird? I'm sure you guys get that a lot. I definitely do. Not really. They're like, why is this pen guy? He's got such a nice pen. That's cool. He must be cool. I want to talk to him. Um, so yeah, some paper towels and tissues are better than others. <laughs> Going back on track. Um, you know, so you just don't want to make sure that you don't get like paper fibers and junk like stuck up in your pen. But as long as you're just like reasonably careful and you kind of pat around it, uh, you'll be fine. My specific personal favorite brand, if I can put on my, my sponsor hat here. If you find yourself needing to clean the grip of your pen, I can recommend none other than Bounty select size paper towels. Thick enough to absorb your ink uh, and thin enough to not break your wallet. These double ply Bounty paper towel pulls off into a half sheet, which nicely folds over like this. And if you want, you can even fold it into a quarter for a nice convenient single hand size for padding of your nib or cleaning up of your ink spills. Not sponsored. Um, yeah, I just, I just like this one. It's, it's good enough quality. And that's, uh, I love the selective size. That's really the main, the main feature. So you don't have a whole huge, like a whole square of paper towels. It's way too big. Um, really something more napkin size is pretty appropriate. In fact, um, you'll see at any given time on my desk, I'll have these like, like 
folded up sheets of paper towel that are just kind of chilling here. Um, I need to do like a, like Stephen Brown does and have like, he's got like an actual like terry cloth towel. Um, and he's, it's just like covered in ink. I should do something like that. I just use disposable towels. Uh, but anyway, so that's how I work. Um, so yeah, I use it on the regular. Been using it for years, never a problem for me. Um, and I think it'll be just fine. So you do not need to go through all the hassle of letting your pens air dry. You know, the only thing I would, the only thing I would do is if you are going to be storing your pens for a long time and not using them, and you know they're going to be like tucked away somewhere and like sealed up, um, I would still do the paper towel routine. You know, get the paper towel on the nib, kind of wick that that air, that stuff out of there. And if you're going to be storing it for a long time, then maybe let the pen air dry overnight or something like that, just to let it you know air out and all that little little small droplets of water get out of there. Um, but yeah, if you're going to be inking it back up again, especially, you don't need to go through all that hassle. Next question is from Ayako Ochan on Instagram. How do you clean behind the plunger when it cannot be unscrewed? Uh, this happens sometimes with cartridge converters. This can happen with piston filling pens. I'm trying to think of what other type of plunger gets ink behind it. And those are the main ones. I guess you could have a vac filler. Excuse me, no, back filler, the ink is meant to get behind the plunger. That's kind of the whole point. Um, no, I can't really think of any other situations, but there may be some other type of fancy filling mechanism that has that. So it's really, it's a, a cartridge converter or a uh, demonstrator pen, um, which let me just caveat by saying there's no real harm to having ink behind your piston. Um, it's really an aesthetic thing, and I understand like sometimes you uh, it just drives you crazy. You see that little bit of ink there, that little bit of water behind there, and you're like, that's not supposed to be there, man. Uh, Got to get rid of that. But really, you don't have to freak out about it too much. It's not like free-flowing uh, back and forth. At some point, it got back there somehow. Um, perhaps it could mix a little bit with you know, whatever ink you have in there, but I've never heard of an issue. Uh, an actual practical issue of like, it drastically changed my ink color, or it it was incompatible ink that was mixed and it caused a pro problem, you know, my pen to seize up. Really, in practicality, it's just the fact that you know it's there that is the biggest problem. Um, sort of like when you have like ink droplets, you know, behind the seal of your pen cap. I'm trying to find a pen cap that has a, a seal on it, Twisby, you know? And it's like ink droplets get back there and you're like, I can't stand those being there. I gotta get rid of them. Even though in, in all practicality, it's not actually hurting anything. It's just that you know it's there. So anyway, the easiest thing to do is just to get over it and to not have it bother you. <laughs> I should say the simplest uh, solution to that. Maybe not the easiest. Um, so the simplest solution would be just ignore it and don't really worry about it because it's not really hurting anything. But I'm guessing that you probably are not gonna go that route, especially if you are sitting here 43 minutes into episode number 242 of, C, of me just sitting here talking about random pen questions. Um, so some pens like Twisby, you can actually disassemble, okay? So that may be an option. Maybe you weren't aware that the pen could disassemble. Twisby is pretty obvious because they like give you a wrench and put it in their literature. So you get a little wrench. The wrench comes in the bottom of the case, if you didn't know, and you can just put it right in here and you get some ink up behind your seal, which is kind of hard with a Twisby because they have a double seal as well. You get this thing in here. And you can just, I always forget which way it goes. Nope, that way. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> I gotta look at the threads and know, because if you go the wrong way, you're gonna tighten it more and that's not the direction you're trying to go. Boom, you unscrew it, you pull it out, clean it, don't disassemble the whole thing, just get the ink from behind the seal, put it right back in there, and you're good to go. So that's pretty easy if you have a pen that can be disassembled like that, um, but that's not always the case. You know, you can't always take it apart. Um, standard international cartridge converters used to disassemble really well, and now more and more of them are um, press to fit and, and not screw in, so they're a little tougher to disassemble and reassemble uh, without totally screwing them up. Uh, so anything that's like that, um, where you have ink behind the seal, you can't disassemble it, um, the best bet is going to be to try to uh, submerge the entire thing under water and then just work the piston back and forth uh, a lot. And um, with a cartridge converter, 
you know, you do that, you have it pointed so that the converter is like straight up and down, so the open end of the converter is down, um, and you, you completely submerge it in a cup of water or something like that. You do it, um, that'll allow any air that's behind the, the, the plunger or the seal to escape, and it'll allow, hopefully, water to get back behind the seal. Now you'll be left with a little bit of water behind the seal, but it should be able to get the ink out of there, and so you don't have ink behind there. Now, getting that every little bit of water out of there, that's kind of another issue, and it just may never be perfect. Um, one thing you could try is compressed air. You can take like uh, either like a can of compressed air, like you use to clean your keyboard, and you can kind of like try and shoot that in there and just get, like shoot like the, the, the butt end of your converter, the, the back end. I'm trying to find a converter locally in my proximity here. Uh, does this diplomat have one in it? Let me see. I feel like making a lot of voices today. I don't know why. Here is one. So standard international cartridge converter. Can I actually disassemble this? No, not easily. So you used to just be able to like unscrew these suckers. Now they're like pressed to fit. It can come off, but it's really kind of a pain. So this one, if you if you have it in a cup of water like this, and then you it's completely submerged, so the water's like coming up over here. And then you just go down and down and down, and eventually the water will kind of work its way behind that seal. Now, when you do it, you're almost certainly going to have leftover water behind your seal. So if that drives you crazy, you're just a lost cause. I'm not sure you're ever going to get over that. <laughs> um, but that's where I'm saying the compressed air you take, and you like put it like right in here on the back end, and you try and like, you know, do that thing. Um, you like my sound effects there? And uh, and then you, you maybe will be able to get some of it, but it just might not be perfect. So I'm just letting you know. Um, you're going to be hating life if that happens to you, and you have to have it perfect. Um, then you can just buy a new converter, and that might be your best option. Uh, but if you have a piston filling pen, you're going to just try to get it as best you can, and you'll have to move on with life. But again, it doesn't really hurt anything. It's more of an aesthetic thing, and uh, that's the best that I know without disassembling the pen. Cool. All right, next question is Eruanikali. Eruanikali on Instagram. I dedicate pens for certain inks and use about 20 pens at a certain time. It takes about a month to use up all the ink if in a converter and months if in a piston filler. Forever if I drop her. Har har. <laughs> I actually wrote har har with an exclamation mark. My question is, what would be an ideal pen hygiene routine for such pens? Because for one, I'm a little lazy to clean pens. At least you're honest. And sometimes I don't feel I have to because I'll be putting in the same ink anyway. Thank you, and I hope you consider my question. Well, I have considered your question, and now your question will be answered. So this will vary a little bit based on the person, based on the pen, based on your surrounding environment, and your local relative humidity in your temperature environment. Um, so I usually use around a month as a guideline for when some sort of maintenance is needed for your pen. Again, it could be more, it could be less. Too many factors to say definitively how it's gonna be, but if it's the exact same ink, you can just, you know, if you got like half a converter in there, just dump that sucker right back in the ink, fill it right back up, and you're good to go. That is probably gonna do it. Really, all you're gonna need to do is get that thing wet again. You may just wanna dump it and flush and fill a couple times just in the ink bottle, because it's the same ink, you know? You may have dried out just a, just a tiny, tiny little bit, but you dump it and flush it and fill it back through with all the ink and dye and everything's gonna be reconstituted and you're gonna be fine and you can keep on rocking. Unless the pen's like completely dried up and crusted out, then you wanna clean it out, okay? Um, so you're gonna have to use kind of your own judgment call on that one. Um, and again, the longer you go, the greater you're increasing your odds of having crustaceous pens. Um, <laughs> uh, I know that happens to me all the time because I don't even limit myself to 20. I might have 40 pens inked up at a time and I'm definitely not using all 40 of them at once. Uh, I am way more uh, about just inking up a pen and writing with it for the feel of the pen or the look of the ink, not necessarily because I have a specific pen like color, you know, for use of different actual purposes. It's not like I always take my meeting notes in green and I always take my, write my handwritten letters in shady purple. Um, no, I don't do that. I have like a very radio voice kind of thing going on today. I don't know why. Anyway, so um, if you want to get a little cleaner, just flush it a few times with water. You don't have to go through this big elaborate thing if you know you're going to be putting the same ink back in it or a similar color ink. You don't have to like completely disassemble and then get all nerdy and toothbrush the feed and you know leave it sitting out for three days while it air dries. 
you don't have to do all that stuff. If you're trying to use your pens, you just want to turn them around again and come back up. Flush it with water a few times, get it so that it's like generally, you know, you got all the ink out of it, and then you can just ink it right back up with the same ink. You just want to get like any dried or crusty stuff out of there, um, and you should be in pretty good shape. Um, you know, pen flush if you really want to kind of go nuts. Um, wipe it with a paper towel before you refill it to get any excess water out of there and refill it. It should take like one minute max. You know, so it's like, okay, if you got 20 pens and your month has come up, you have your bottles of ink, you can just refill them if you want to or if you want to actually clean them out. Just spend 20 minutes or half an hour at the sink, you know, put your phone up there, watch Netflix or Hulu or something, or you can live stream while you do it like I do. Um, and you can make an event out of it. Uh, and it's just like one event you do once a month. So you just kind of build that into your life. 20 pens is kind of a lot. It's on kind of the upper end uh, of the range, um, but it's not impossible. It's totally manageable to successfully keep 20 pens inked at a time and not have it consume your entire life um, in terms of maintaining them. Cool. All right, it's time for an ink question. This is question number six. Doing okay on time. Um, G Busby on Instagram. What is the darkest orange ink that you're aware of? Like a black orange, if you will. Well, what if I won't? Because I kind of won't, because I don't really have a black orange, but I'll do my best, okay? Um, Diamine Ancient Copper kind of falls in the, the border of whether it's actually an orange or not. Maybe it's more brown, maybe it's more coppery. Um, you could probably make an argument for it being orange. That's going to be the darkest that I can think of. Um, but if you don't consider it orange, if you're more of an orange purist, um, Diamine Sunset, Noodler's Cayenne, Monteverde Mandarin Orange, perhaps? Monteverde Fire Opal. I'm going like darker as I go here. Robert Oster Burned Orange. Not burnt orange, burned orange. Um, there isn't really a black orange. You know, if you kind of think of like, oh, there's a blue black, is there a, is there an orange black or a red black? Nah, not necessarily so much. Um, so uh, if none of these are dark enough for you, then you can actually experiment a little bit with making your own darker orange. Uh, just add a drop of black into your orange ink. It's not like you need to go 50-50. If you go 50-50 orange and black, you're gonna get black. Um, but you can experiment a little bit, you know, get yourself an ink sample vial, you know, with a decent volume of orange ink. And because you're trying to go for an orange black, what I would do if I were you, I would get a vial, fill it mostly with orange, and try just dropping like one drop of black ink at a time. Try and stick within the brand if you can, because when you go cross brand, you could be getting different you know, chemical makeup and stuff like that. And you could have some kind of weird reaction. Um, but if you go with a pretty standard, like unconventional or conventional black ink, you're probably gonna be just fine. Like if you're using Noodlers, you can use Noodlers black with pretty much everything except base dates. Um, and I think you'll be okay. Um, going with a neutral pH as possible is really good. Noodlers black is neutral, so that's pretty cool. Um, so whatever your ink sample is, um, say it's, you know, you know, cayenne or whatever. Um, okay, that's fine. So you can add a drop of Noodler's Black to it, shake it up for a few seconds, get yourself a little glass pen if you want to, or if you really feel like dipping a nib, a fountain pen nib, you can. It's just a little more to clean out. This is why I keep glass pens basically is for this kind of thing. In fact, you can see this is a Noodler's Legal Blue that uh, I needed to do something with the other day and I haven't cleaned off my glass pen yet, which is probably going to be a disaster when I go to do that. But anyway, it's been drying on my desk for the last two days. That's my life, people, okay? Uh, I play with pen things. My desk is a disaster right now. Anyway, Noodler's Legal Blue. That's not what I was talking about though. My mind is all over the place. Where am I? In my, in my head, where am I at? Black orange, that's what you can do. Add a drop of black ink, swab it up. Not dark enough, add another drop of black. Swab it up, another drop of black. Swab it up, another drop of black. Oh, that's too black? Crap, ruined a vial. Oh well, you dump that, then you know, okay, one vial, three drops of black, not four, is perfect, or as good as I'm going to get. And then you can rock on with your custom made orange black ink. And if you come up with the perfect orange black ink, Please tell me the formula so that I can maybe create it for you. That'd be kind of cool. There's a whole world of like ink mixing and stuff like that that you could really have a good time if you are so inclined. All right, now I have a troubleshooting question. This is from Anthony Draper on Instagram. 
I got my first new gold nib fountain pen six slash seven months ago. I can rarely write with it for more than a paragraph or two. The ink won't flow through it. Do I just need to use it more? Or is there something wrong with it that needs replaced? Probably not replaced, hopefully not. Um, so some things that I'd really love to know is what pen you have and how long you're going in between writing. But since this is not an interactive type of situation, I'm just gonna have to make assumptions. Whenever I hear a question like this, like, my pen's not writing like it should, or it's stopping when I'm trying to write with it. It's really difficult because there's so many different factors going on, especially if it's like you've had it six or seven months, you say it's your first gold nib fountain pen. I don't know if it's your first pen ever. You know, so I'm going to just lean a little bit towards the newbie end of my advice, okay? So forgive me if I'm speaking too elementary for you. It's not meant to be an insult. I'm just trying to be as helpful and break it down. It's sort of like when you have a problem with your computer, you're like, have you tried turning it off and turning it back on again? Um, if you've ever seen the IT crowd or the IT crowd on Netflix, highly recommended. It's a British comedy. It's very funny. And they literally have like an answering machine that's like, have you tried turning it off and turning it back on again? Because that fixes like most problems, right? So the fountain pen version of have you tried rebooting it is, well, have you tried cleaning it out and then inking it back up? It's literally gonna be my first recommendation for you. Clean out your pen because you could have had something maybe like not perfect with the pen cleaning related because sometimes, you know, when pens are manufactured, there's a little bit of machining oil or a little dust or a little something in there and it doesn't flow perfectly clear. Most pens in their instructions will say, clean the pen first before using it. Doesn't necessarily have to be done for everybody, but that will help. So first off, whenever somebody has any type of relatively new pen and it's not flowing perfectly like they think, I'm always like, clean it out, ink it back up and try it again. That's always my first recommendation. Next one is, um, you know, you know, clean it thoroughly, obviously. Um, try to eliminate like the paper as a variable, try and eliminate the ink as a variable. Cause sometimes you're just using a really dry ink and just maybe that pen doesn't like how dry that ink is or the paper you have is really absorbent and it's just sucking too much ink out. Like the cards that we use, for example, for our uh, thank you cards, the Goulet thank you cards, they're very absorbent. Cardstock in general tends to be very absorbent. And there's pens that I never have had a problem writing with before, like broad nib pens with pretty white writing ink that will dry out when writing on these cards. So try different paper and see if you can eliminate that as a variable. Um, but if you're like, no, I know this paper is good. I've used this ink in 18 other pens and it all writes, writes perfect. And this ink is just too dry in this pen. So once you've tried that, if you're like, nope, I cleaned it, inked it back up, it's not it. I know it's not a problem with the ink, whatever. Just try another ink, try other paper and stuff like that. See if you can eliminate that. If you do all that stuff and you know it's still an issue, then you're like, okay, maybe there's something uh, going on. But I think, I bet like 95% just going through those steps, you will get it writing better. Um, Try and um, refill the pen every three to four weeks, kind of like I alluded to with the question about having the 20 pens um, just a second ago. You know, making sure that you're that you're writing with the pen on a pretty regular basis. Um, if you're not writing with it that often, it could be that the ink is just drying up in the pen. That totally happens, depending on what your ink you're using, especially if you're using a shimmer ink or anything with a high level of sheen. Those tend to clog up a little bit more. There's certain inks that like, you know, like Diamine Pumpkin, Jerbon Rouge Hematite, those types of things, they tend to like crust up. Um, uh, Monteverde Fire Opal, those tend to crust up a little bit and can cause flow. It cleans off just fine, but if it sits there and is not getting used and flowing through on a regular basis, it tends to, tends to gather up inside the pen. Um, and then consider how you're storing it. You know, if I find if you're having a storing pen nib up, um, that tends to um, have it dry out a little bit more. So storing it horizontal or maybe even nib down, if you have a pen that tends to be a little dry, that maybe could be part of it. And if you're doing all these things and it's still writing dry, you know, if, if it's like, uh, sometimes like people write really, really, really fast and they just, there there's a lot of ink demand on the pen, that could be part of the issue. But if you're like, no, that's not it. The pen's sitting up and as soon as I start trying to write with it, it's dry. And you're doing all this and you're like, no, it's clean. I just inked it up you know, two hours ago, and it's just a problem. I feel like something's wrong. I would recommend reaching out to the retailer where you got it um, and maybe see if maybe perhaps you have a defect because that 
that has happened. Um, or if that's too much hassle or it was a gift or you don't know where they got it or it's outside of warranty or something like that, um, maybe consider taking it to a Nibmeister. They can they can definitely fix it. You know, nibgrinder.com um, is the one that I recommend, Mark Bacchus, um, or there's plenty of other, not plenty, but there's some others um, that you consider sending it to if it's a meaningful, you know, since it's a gold nib pen, like this might be a more significant one that you want to invest in. You know, to fix a flow issue like that, you're looking like, $30 something with shipping and all that kind of stuff. So um, usually a relatively easy fix, um, assuming there's not something crazy wrong with it. But that is sort of my process for diagnosing that sort of thing. A bit of work, I will admit, not ideal for like you buy a golden pen, you're like, this was expensive. Man, this really stinks that it's not working perfectly like I thought. But <clears throat> like anything else, there's gonna be a learning curve. Once you get it working well, it's gonna be amazing, but you know, you got to get it there. It's like any other fine instrument. You kind of have to do a little bit of work and know how to use it to really get it to, you know, sing. And last question I have for this week, this is a business question. So I've gone through without like going crazy over on time. It's not too bad. I have a time marker on my monitor here, by the way, if you're like, why do you keep looking down and to the right over there? It's because of my monitor with the timestamp. Um, question for our business from Josh R on Facebook. How receptive are most pen companies to the feedback you get from customers and pass on to them? Good question, Josh. Cause if you're like, I keep giving you all feedback and you don't freaking change a thing. You want to know whether it's my fault or theirs, right? Well, I'm going to pass the buck. It's always their fault. I'm just kidding. It's not always the case, but often, um, <laughs> the answer is it varies a lot. Um, you know, every company has different level of feedback that they are willing slash able to receive. Um, but that's a huge benefit to the distribution network that exists in the pen world. So um, sometimes, you know, manufacturers are in stages of their business life or in stages of their product development where they want a lot of feedback because they are looking to make iterations, looking to make changes, looking to really gain the feedback from the end user to use the business term, um, but you all who are actually writing with the pens. You know, I can give them feedback for me as a retailer, but they want the feedback from the people that you're using this pen day in and day out for seven months or two years or 18 years. They may not still be making the pen after 18 years, but still the people that are like, it is ingrained in their life and they really have dedicated interest and feedback in that. Um, they care about that kind of feedback, so they like to hear it. Can they hear it directly? Not always practically. So they rely on retailers, distributors, that network of people who have a vested, especially a financially vested interest in improving their products on gathering all that feedback and then providing it to them. So um, in general, they're usually pretty receptive. Now, that said, a lot of people have very different interests and tastes and perspectives. It can be difficult to sort out all of the feedback that comes our way um, and providing it into like a meaningful fashion. But we will often just kind of give them like, here's a lot of what we're hearing about said pen. Blah, 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 beep, blah, blah, blah. We hear this a lot. We hear this all the time. I don't want to hear this anymore. Please fix this. Yada, yada, yada. We hear this every now and then. This is a situation for some people in some situations, da, 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 da. And we'll just kind of pass it all up and then let them do with it what they will, except for those things that rise to the top. That's like, everybody who buys this pen says this is a huge problem. You need to fix it. And if I really want to be heavy handed, I'll be like, I'm not going to carry this pen anymore unless you fix this problem. Um, or I'm going to drop this pen because it's not selling well, but if you fix this thing or come out with this color or do this change, that will save the pen. Um, so that usually gets the most attention, <laughs> but it's pretty heavy handed. I don't want to be the boy that cries wolf, right? So, um, you know, I would say with each kind of like zooming out a little bit, um, with each day that passes, I would say most companies are paying more and more attention to what you all are thinking about their products because most companies have realized that like in this day and age, listening to people and giving the people what they want will help you stick around and not go out of business. Shocking. No, it's not like a super new business concept, but um, everybody has a voice on social media. And one of the things that we do here at Goulet Pens especially is we are talking with you all every single day on email, live chat, you know, phone calls, every social media platform. We are really trying to pay attention to what's going on. We did a, we have a whole team. I mean, we have, let's see here, seven, eight, 
on the media team in seven. Um, well, really eight and nine with our processors. Yeah, we have, we have half our company um, that is dedicated to receiving your feedback um, on a pretty regular basis. So that's a, that's a lot of man and woman power uh, behind gathering your feedback. And so we try to structure that and then pass it on um, to manufacturers uh, and distributors so that they can do stuff with it. Um, the larger the company is, the more feedback they're getting in general over the, across the whole world. So, you know, our feedback might get a little diluted just because, you know, a company like Lamy or Pilot that might have thousands and thousands of retailers across the world, we're just one of those retailers. Are they going to listen to everything that we say as gospel? No, they're going to take that input uh, as a data point. Now, it might be a very meaningful data point to them. Um, or they may say, okay, in the U.S. market, this is something that's really huge and important, but the European market may feel completely differently. Point in fact, the pilot vanishing point crossed lines um, has not been a super hot, amazingly, you know, just go nuts pen. In fact, it is unheard of for us to still have the previous year's pilot vanishing point limited edition. Us personally at Goulet Pens. Um, it's because that pen is, is one that was designed for the European market, and apparently it's been doing better there. It's a relatively uninteresting pen for the U.S. market to, by comparison, compared to like the, the um, Twilight that came out a few years ago, or the Sunrise, so uh, Crimson Sunrise. So those ones tended to just blow out in the U.S., not as greatly received in Europe. So a manufacturer that's thinking much more globally they're going to hear very different feedback from different markets and it all kind of gets confusing. So they have to really understand where that feedback's coming from and what market it's for. Um, so it tends to get a little bit um, uh, slower. The bigger a company is and the wider they are involved in different markets within the world, um, the less receptive, not receptive, but the less uh, quick to act they may be on individualized feedback. Um, but they do still like to hear it. Um, whereas a company like, you know, that's much smaller, like Edison Pens in Milan, Ohio, and they only have a handful of retailers, um, they're gonna be super receptive to our feedback, right? So it's just different, it's just different levels, different perspectives, but even still, um, a company like Lamy, way more people have Lamy Pens, so the messaging and the, the, the feedback we get is gonna be very crystal clear right, because it's uh, so many people are saying it. Um, yeah, sometimes companies are very receptive, but it's not so easy for them to act on it. Um, and it depends what the feedback is. If you're like, oh yeah, you should really make nibs out of uh, nitriol instead of stainless steel. And that's the universal thing. Well, it's kind of complicated. It's never really been done. I think that's the right material, if I'm, if I'm correct. Go look that up on Google. Actually, I'm kind of curious. Did I say the right thing? Hang with me for a hot second. Nitriol. Oh, nitrile. No, that's glove material. Nitriol? What is that? I think I might have just made that up. Nope, I think I just made that up. What the heck is that material? It's not nitrite. No, that's a chemistry thing. Dang. Now I might have to just get your help in asking what this is. That's okay. If you're hanging with me after an hour, you're okay. Chilling for a hot second. There's a material out there that is that is um, has a fant it's it's flexible, but it has a fantastic memory. So if you if you get it wet, so like it'll bend, but when you get it wet, it'll you can like twist it and turn it all around. It starts with like a night night something, and I cannot remember what it's called, and it's embarrassing me. I didn't think of it until I would have looked it up and put it in my notes, but I cannot remember what it is. So, not nitriol because that's made up, but something else. If you know this material of what I'm talking about, um, please leave it in the comments so that I can be uh, not dumb. Let me get back to my notes here. Really derailed. Anyway, so if you say you should make, I should, I'll use a different material. If you're like, you should make, um, you know, fountain pen nibs out of unobtainium, then uh, that's going to be difficult for them to do. And even though they may be very receptive to that feedback, it may not actually go anywhere, right? 
Um, that said, all that said about the whole feedback thing, I can't encourage you enough to keep giving feedback. It is the lifeblood of the Goulet Pen Company for sure, uh, but it does actually make a difference. And the more that I have been doing this whole video in the social media thing, you know, we're coming up on 10 years here at Goulet, and uh, we have a lot of respect, I think, for how much we've stuck with it and how engaged we've been with the pen community over the years that it's now to the point where pen companies are way more receptive to our feedback, especially than they were a long time ago. But just the bigger we get and the longer we're around, the more respect we have and the more we have their ear. So if you keep giving us your feedback, we will keep passing it along and making great things happen. <laughs> My question of the week for this week is, if there was one thing that you could tell to any pen company and you knew they would listen to whatever you say and make it happen, what would that be? So pick a pen company, pick your feedback. What's the one thing that you want them to hear and act on? Let me know in the comments and I'll point our manufacturers to it and I'll be like, look in the comments, the people have spoken, shazam. Or maybe I'll just pass out the feedback and be like, can you please, can you please make this change? Um, which is probably more often the case of what it does. I try to be very respectful. I'm not like, I don't say shazam, look in the comments, but <laughs> I do pass things around sometimes. If there's like overwhelming feedback in the comments and y'all are being super raw with your feedback, sometimes if I'm trying to get them to like, you know, message received, uh, I will point them and be like, you want to hear like unfiltered what people are saying about your product? Go look in Goulet Notion, go look on this YouTube video, read these comments, and you will see the comments that we're hearing every single day. And uh, that gets through to them sometimes. So keep on leaving that feedback. We'd love to hear it. Like, comment, subscribe if you've not already. Uh, and yeah, appreciate you sticking with me on this Q&A. I just freaking love making these videos. I just, it doesn't get old. Like I was at this work conference, I gave a presentation about video marketing at this conference I was at in New Orleans and like everybody was dumbfounded. I was like, we've done 1600 videos. I didn't even count live videos and stuff. We've probably actually done more like 2000 videos if you count all the periscopes and Instagram lives and everything that we've ever done. I haven't kept track of all those, but it's probably over 2000. But even still in my presentation, I was like 1600 videos over nine years. That's a video every other day on average. And everybody was like, dang. That is some dedication. I was like, you know what? It really is, but I love it. I do it because I love it and because I love you all. I really do. I love you all. I'm not afraid to go there. I'm secure enough to say I love you all, especially those of you who have stuck in with me an hour and 12 minutes into it. You all are the true supporters of what we're doing here. So thank you. I hope you have a fantastic weekend, a great rest of your week. Check out a lot of what I talked about here on GoulayPens.com. Thanks so much for watching yet another Q&A, and right on.